um, as you know, this starts a new quarter. And so I'm back in here in the adult class and, uh, in, and glad to be back in here. I very much enjoyed teaching the teens this last quarter, but I enjoy teaching the adults as well. Uh, what I don't enjoy is missing a whole quarter's worth of material and being thrown in the middle of the divided kingdom to do a review. And so I'm going to rely heavily upon Austin, who was in the class last quarter, to, uh, to, to work through a lot of the details of the review this quarter. Um, the purpose of the review is to help the teachers like myself who were in the other classes last quarter and missed uh, what, was, what was done kind of bring us up to speed of where the adult class is at. Also, if you've not been with us before, what we are doing is we are working through the Bible starting in Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, and we're just looking at the theme of the Bible, the narrative of the Bible over about a four and a half year period. And right now, we're right in the middle of the Old Testament with the divided kingdom when Judah and Israel have divided. And uh, we're going to do a review of where that division takes place after the death of Solomon and uh, on up until pretty much the end of the northern kingdom of Israel. I like to begin every quarter with a word of prayer, and so if you don't mind, why don't we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Almighty God, Father, we are very grateful that we have the opportunity, the health, the uh, time, the ability to be able to get together in the middle of the week and to study from your word. We're grateful that we have copies of your word, that it's easily accessible to us, that we have the freedoms that we do. And we meet regularly and probably take a lot of these blessings for granted. And we want to stop and thank you for giving us the opportunity to study the word like we are going to tonight. We're thankful for everyone here. We're thankful for the teachers that are teaching in the different classes. We're thankful for the teachers that taught last quarter. Pray that their work was was successful and continue to do good. Pray that those that are teaching this next quarter will have good health, that they will be able to take the things that they've prepared to say and studied and be able to convey them in a way that makes an impact on, on the hearts of the, our, young, our young people and all of us in this class as well. Thank you for this day. Be with us tonight. Be with me and Austin as we lead the discussion uh, over this next three months. And we pray, Father, that it'll be profitable to your glory. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. By the way, would you like control of the clicker since... I don't have enough to keep up with that. That's right. You ready to get started? Yes, sir. Are you all ready to get started? Okay. Well, I don't know how this works. So, do you want me to operate the clicker? Well, we'll be there for a while. It'll okay. Be okay. All right. So, we just mentioned that coming off the previous quarter, we we went through the end of the United Kingdom, and who was last king of the United Kingdom? Solomon. Solomon. What would be the one word we use for Solomon? Wisdom. wisdom. Right. And maybe we would say we have spiritual wisdom. We all certainly have earthly wisdom. Uh, you see his kingdom doing well, things prospering. When we get into this quarter, he's gone. We have his son. Who's his son? Rehoboam. All right. Could we use the same word to describe Rehoboam? No. In fact, we might in some ways use the opposite word. Uh, we call him a fool in some ways. Because he's presented with the opportunity early on to really make the people want to serve him. And is he able to take advantage of that opportunity? No. No. Uh, he, he gets bad advice and he listens to the bad. He, well, he does get good advice. He gets good and bad advice, listens to the bad. And how does that end up? Not good, right? Ends up in the division of the land. Now, this division was already prophesied uh, because when Solomon was reigning, we had someone else come up. His name is Jeroboam, all right? Jeroboam was promised that he would get ten tribes and there would be two left for the house of Solomon. So when this division happens, that's exactly what happens. Rehoboam gets the two tribes. Jeroboam gets ten. Now, what's actually interesting about Rehoboam uh, during this time is that when this division happens, uh, he wants to try to bring them back forcefully. He's told not to, right? Because this is God's will. God's will, that, or at least is God's uh, prophecy. So it's being fulfilled. And 
what's taught, uh, what's said about Rehoboam is that he actually did deal wisely in how he strengthened his nation. But that does not make him a wise king overall. In fact, we would look at him and say he was a wicked king overall. Uh, he reigned 41 years, and uh, he's throughout this 41 years being oppressed pretty much the whole time. You anything else about Rehoboam? Yeah, so why does this division take place? Yeah, because of Solomon's sin. And so I want you to keep that theme all the way through this. We're going to see, I mean, this, this review is loaded with problems as far as the problems in the nation. Why are these problems there? And you're going to see that reoccurring. Because they sinned. They rebelled against God. They wouldn't listen. Solomon wouldn't listen. Therefore, God said, the kingdom will be taken away from you. Now it's given to Jeroboam, taken out of his, his family's control. That's right. So speaking of Jeroboam, when we go to Israel... Uh, Jeroboam has a problem, and his problem is that he's afraid the people are going to go back to Judah. Why is he afraid of that? Because of the worship. That's right. Worship was centered in Judah, in Jerusalem. And so what does he do to fix it? Well, fix it. <laughs> Place of worship. Who they worship. When they, who, yeah, when they worship. And then who orchestrates it, right? So remember, he sets up his own priest. Um, how does that go? Does that go well? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, so I guess he kind of in some way keeps his people, but does he keep all the people? No. That's right. The priests leave. Uh, and really, it's just all, I think it says, all who sought the Lord, who had their hearts set to seek the Lord. They all left and went to Judah because they weren't going to put up with that. Now, uh, maybe you want to say a little bit more about this particular... Yeah, so this is a, I mean, a critical moment in the history of God's people, uh, particularly for the northern kingdom of Israel. Because what they do here is, do they completely turn their back on, on Jehovah God? No. When they're worshiping the golden calves that he made in Dan and Bethel, uh, this is the God. This, this is Yahweh that, that we're serving. But that was totally contrary to what's, what's, what, what's the second commandment, uh, the Ten Commandments? Yeah, you, you shall know the gods before me, you shall make no graven image. And, and here they've made a graven image. Major departure. From this point on in Israel's history, you will see that the kings are referred to as they continued in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And so this becomes a defining moment where they make a departure from God's will and it just starts to snowball. And there's so many good lessons in that for us. You know, people say, well, why do you go back and study this stuff? Well, it's because the lessons are still applicable for us. When you make a departure from God's will, it's going to snowball. And that's what's happening. Yeah. And, and this, this worship is professing to worship God. And it'll be interesting later on when we get to some other people and who they decide to worship. You will see, I think, that this is maybe referred to in a more positive light compared to those other types of worship. But it's still never accepted. And it's because it's changed what God had wanted. All right. So what we also see with Jeroboam is that he has this sin. He's given opportunities to change, but he doesn't. So how do you think this is going to result for him? That's right. So the kingdom's going to be taken away from his family. So that's, that's going to be prophesied. And so that's going to happen. And so we see that he dies after reigning for 22 years. So his sin will lead to his whole house's destruction, and then he meets his end. What's she looking for? I was looking to see how Larson had that divided as far as the different families when it, when a new order, new dynasty comes into being. Gotcha. All right, so there's going to be, as you can imagine, there's going to be a lot of jumping back and forth through this between Judah and Israel. And I'm going to do my best to let you know which kingdom we're talking about at a certain time. And we're about to go back to Judah now. All right, so we were, you know, at Rehoboam at first, and Jeroboam, now we're going back to Judah. So Rehoboam's son, which is going to be Abijam or Abijah, comes to reign, and he reigns for three years. He's wicked. And as far as I can tell, basically the only good thing that he did was that he rebuked Jeroboam and his way of worship. And he says, you shouldn't be worshiping like that. Now, that didn't mean that Abijam was doing what he ought to be doing, but, you know, he did rebuke Jeroboam. He called out to God when he was in danger and battle against Jeroboam. Uh, but other than that, he was a wicked king. Anything to say about him? Yeah, no. Uh, well, yes, I will. I will say something about him. So it, it's interesting that what we have, uh, when you think about how many good kings did the northern kingdom have? We'll just go ahead and lay that out there. 
How many good kings did the northern kingdom of Judah have? Zero. Not a single one. Never had a good king. Judah is going to have several good kings, but Judah also has a lot of um, uh, religion and name only. And I think Abijah really demonstrates that well. He rebukes uh, Jeroboam. He rebukes the, the nation. Well, y'all don't even worship God the way you're supposed to. Y'all, y'all worship this, these idols up there, and you don't have the right priest and all of that. Well, that was true. They had the right priest and everything, but they weren't faithful to the Lord. They, they didn't love the Lord their God with all of their heart and all their soul. And so you think that has any application to us today? Sure can. And so we need to realize God's not pleased just because we have a right form of worship. He wants us to be genuine and sincere in that as well. All right. Then we have Asa. So Asa is going to be the son of Abijah. He reigns for 41 years and he is righteous. And so he tries to undo a lot of the things that his fathers had done. Uh, he tries to get rid of idols. He tries to bring the people's hearts back to the Lord. He has them swear an oath to the Lord. And his heart was with the Lord. And then we see that at a certain point, he's at war with Israel. And in this war with Israel, he decides to trust in Ben-Hadad. Why would that be a problem? Not trusting in God. Not trusting in God. That's exactly right. So he trusts in Ben-Hadad instead of trusting in the Lord. And that's exactly what he was rebuked for. Uh, but what's odd is that Asa is a righteous king. But when he's rebuked, he does not seem to repent of this. He doesn't seem to repent and turn back and uh, maybe even acknowledge his sin here. So he doesn't seek the Lord when he's in his old age. He has a disease in his feet. He seeks uh, the medics or the physicians, it says. And so you have, it seems like a really good start, really positive things going on at the beginning. And then at the end, we not necessarily that he never did anything good at the end, but we really only have recorded negative things about it. Is that he lost his faith in the Lord. He didn't trust in the Lord. Uh, so he may have been righteous overall, but he had some things at the end that were not good. What do you say about that? I will say this about that. We are going to see several kings that kind of pretty much follow this pattern as well. They may start off really strong, and they don't end strong. Uh, and so you'll see that, obviously, mainly with Judah. You don't see that really with Israel, but you'll see several in Judah that start off really strong, really righteous, doing what's right, and they can't keep it going. All right, so we're going to jump back to Israel now. So in Israel, we have Jeroboam's son, Nadab, take the throne. Uh, he reigns for two years, so not for very long. He's evil, so it does take time to mention that. And then he's killed. He's killed by Baesha. So Baesha is going to be our new king. Um, and I should mention that this is going to be something that fulfills God's prophecy. So Baesha comes in, kills Nadab, kills all of Jeroboam's house. We have a new line started. Now, this is also going to be something. We're talking about themes here. Uh, one thing that we're going to see as a theme is that in Israel, you're going to have lots of changes. Judah, not really. There's really only maybe one instance where you have a change. But with uh, Israel, you're going to have lots of changes in um, kingly lines. And so this is our first one. Who's the Messianic promise through? What, what lineage is the Messianic promise? The Christ going to come through who? David. David and Judah. Yes, Judah and David. And so that lineage is going to stay the same all the way through in the kingdom of Judah. But in Israel, it's going to bounce all over the place. But I want you to notice something that happens right here. Baasha wipes out Jeroboam. Now, now God told Jeroboam, now look, you had a chance. I gave you the kingdom and you completely rebelled against me. Your whole family is going to be wiped out as a consequence of that. Baasha is the one that does that. Do you think Baasha does that because... I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to do what God... Why is He doing it? That's exactly... He's doing it for His own selfish motives. Have we seen anything like this among God's people before where a king wipes out a whole family to preserve himself? We haven't. This is, the, this is what the pagans do. And now God's people are behaving like that. And I want you to see this progression as they, as, as they become more and more like the nations around them, more and more like the world. This is the first step with Baasha. So speaking of, uh, he was talking about, does he do this in order to fulfill God's word and obey God? The answer is no. And in fact, what he does is he follows in Jeroboam's practices. So the reason Jeroboam's line's ending is because of the way he had set up worship 
uh, Baasha comes in and does the exact same thing. So you want to guess what God promises him? The same thing. He says, mm -hmm. all right, you did the same thing as Jeroboam, so I'm not having any of that either. Uh, and so you have the same promise there, and we see that he's going to die. His son, Elah, okay, do you want to say something? No. Okay, yeah, his son, Elah, reigns for two years. He was evil, and he's killed. So he's killed by Zimri, who is one of his commanders, and he kills the whole house. So again, this is fulfilling God's prophecy here that that line is going to end, and it does. Anything to say about that? Okay. Yeah, so Zimri, seven days, that's a long dynasty, isn't it? Does anybody remember what happens to Zimri? Yeah, Omri comes and challenges him after only a few days. He barricades himself in the building and then sets it on fire and burns himself to death. Do you see the chaos that's taking place here? This is just, this is just a little while after Solomon's reign when, when things were so stable and so good and yet wickedness have crept in and the nation's just falling apart now, just falling apart. Stability may not always be a good thing yeah. because next we're going to have Omri who's going to come after Zimri and we will have stability in Omri's house for a while. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's good stability. So you have, like you said, you have Zimri. He lasts a week. Um, I should mention Omri because apparently I just didn't realize it before reading it through this time that at the beginning of Omri's reign, there were actually two kings reigning in Israel. He's the one that ends up winning out out of those two. Uh, and then he's going to reign for 12 years. He's also the one that makes Samaria the capital of Israel. So that's going to be pretty notable because that's where their capital is going to be from then on out. We have some uh, archaeological notes about Omri. Omri is mentioned in some chronicles of different, different world kings. Uh, apparently he was a very good military leader, a, a, a good politician, uh, looked at by the world as a strong leader. Do you know what God had to say about him? He's wicked. He's wicked. So that's interesting that the world can look at someone and say, oh, wow, that's a strong, that's a strong leader. And God look at that same person and says, they're wicked. And, uh, and, and, and I, don't, I, I can't use that. That's not, that's not useful for me. And uh, that's what we have with Omri. I'll also mention this. It does specifically say Omri practices uh, Jeroboam's form of worship. And the reason I miss, mention that with him is because when we get to his son Ahab, that will not be the case with Ahab. You ready to move on to him? Yeah. Yeah. Ahab's everybody's favorite king of Israel. So Ahab starts to reign. He reigns 22 years. Uh, good or bad? Obviously bad, but how bad? Yeah, like the worst at this point, right? A new level. Yeah. yeah. He is the worst. So he abandons. Why is, why is, why is he at a new level? Idol worship. But can you tell me kind of where that originates from? Jezebel, Jezebel, that's right. He had married a pagan wife, and, uh, and, and she brings a lot of those pagan practices. He was a weak king, and she brings a lot of those pagan practices in, uh, so Baal worship becomes a thing now. Up to this point, we've had the kings continuing the sins of Jeroboam, which was the idol worship, worshiping God, but through an idol. Now they're worshiping other gods. They're worshiping Baal, which levels us up to a whole different different problem. So now the snowball is getting bigger. Yes. So earlier when I said there will be other types of worship to where Jeroboam, Jeroboam's worship is preferable, I guess, it would be compared to this, right? So some of the things that we see with Ahab, we don't have time to get into everything because actually we have a lot about Ahab. But some of the things we see with him is it seems like he sacrifices his children, uh, we see that he is consistently opposed by Elijah, who was a prophet. And so he's consistently opposed by God, doesn't seem to phase him. In fact, he seems to uh, really lash out and return to that. Um, we, we just see a lot of, like I said, a lot, a lot of wickedness here. Um, do you want to say more about Ahab before I kind of talk a little bit about Elijah? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. So then we talk about Elijah for a little bit within the whole Ahab story. And so Elijah does a few things here. So one of the things he does is he prophesies about a drought. Uh, we see that um, Ahab tries to send for him and that we have the showdown at Mount Carmel. And so, by the way, showdown at Mount Carmel, what is that all about? 
I reference that like it's, you know, we shall just know, but it's actually pretty important to understand what that's about. Against Elijah, and they go themselves. That's right. They, it's, they try to call them, I guess, for their God to protect them and show Elijah who's false. None of that works because God's with Elijah. He calls and lots of everything out. That's right. It's God versus Baal, right? It's God versus Baal. And this is important because they, they're given right now to Baal worship. And so the answer is pretty definitive, right? Who's in control? God is in control, right? Baal can't do anything. Uh, and they mock Baal and all of that. Uh, God is the one that's in control, and it's, there's really no question about that uh, by the end of that. Um, we have the prof those prophets of Baal, at least. I guess there are new ones that come up later. But those prophets of Baal are killed. Uh, and you see the people kind of get behind Elijah at this point. And so that seems to be kind of a little bit of a positive thing um, until we get to how Jezebel feels about this, right? So Jezebel is obviously the one to introduce Baal worship. How is she going to feel about all her prophets being killed? Not, Not good. And she wants to kill Elijah. So Elijah has to leave. He goes out of the wilderness. God takes care of him. Um, while he's out there, he's obviously distraught. He's told to do a few things. And I, I'm going to take the time to mention at least a couple of these. So two of the things he's told to do, because these are both people that are going to come up uh, in this story is one, he's told to anoint Haziel, king over Syria, and he's told to anoint Elisha to be a prophet. Okay, So both of the, both those things we're going to see come up, and we're going to see how those things play out. Uh, and we see that right after this, he does go and call Elisha. You anything you want to say before I get to Naboth? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. All right, so the next story we get with Ahab is about Naboth's vineyard. So this is, I think, a good story to talk about what you were just saying a second ago. Uh, Ahab is a wicked king, but he is a weak king. He's a weak, wicked king. So he sees Naboth's vineyard. He wants it. Naboth says no. How does Ahab react? He passed. That's right. And she is a solution, doesn't she? So what's the solution? Kill him. Get him out of the way. And that's exactly what she does. How does Ahab feel about that? He got his vineyard. Yeah, he's happy. He's happy about that. So he is weak. He allows his wife to do these kind of things. I mean, it doesn't bother him. And in fact, he rejoices at the result. Even though he wouldn't do it himself, he rejoices at the result. Now, uh, let's see. Because of this, God sends Elijah. Uh, as if everything Ahab had done was not enough. God sends Elijah, and you want to guess what he tells Ahab? <coughs> this is going to be the end, uh, end of his rule. Now, and he also proclaims judgment on Jezebel. I, I have to mention that too. Now, this actually seems to strike a nerve with Ahab, and he does have a moment of humility here. So, because of this moment of humility, God says that he will not destroy Ahab's house while he is king. So, it you know, doesn't say anything about what's going to happen next necessarily, but it won't be while he's king. His house will be destroyed still, but not while he's king. Let me, you mind if I jump to Jeroboam? I mean, uh, to, to Jehoshaphat, rather? Yeah, that's I'm great. That. Okay. All right. Let me tell you something that's really interesting about this. This is a very pivotal time right now because we said Jeroboam was a very pivotal time because we have a departure and we begin idol worship. With, with Ahab, it's a very pivotal time because now we have Baal worship introduced. It's another pivotal time because we have Jehoshaphat also reigning at the same time. Ahab reigning in the north in Israel, Jehoshaphat reigning in the south in Judah. Jehoshaphat, good king or bad king? Very good king. The polar opposite of Ahab in the north. Do you know what the irony is? These two guys become friends. What happens with evil companions? They corrupt good morals. All right. So Jehoshaphat doesn't become corrupt, but this is going to be a pivotal time because you've got nothing going on good in Israel, some good things going on in Judah, and now all of that is in danger because of this friendship. So this kind of pivotal time, God intervenes. And the way he intervenes is he intervenes with Elijah and later Elisha. We have not seen a prophet 
like Elijah since Moses. There hasn't been a period of time where there's been these radical signs and wonders and miracles done since Moses. When you see a period in divine history where there are a lot of signs and wonders and, and miraculous things done, God's trying to make a point. What do you think the point God's trying to make at this point in history? I'm still in control. You better change your ways. Get focused here. You all are at a tipping point. This is a pivotal moment. You need to return to me. And so God's trying to get their attention by working these miracles through Elijah, later Elisha, trying to get Israel to turn back, trying to get Judah not to adopt the practices of Israel. And so that's the reason why there's so many, uh, so many stories about Elijah and Elisha and these miraculous events. God's really trying to curb the tide of wickedness that is, is about to flow into the southern kingdom of Judah as well because of this alliance between Ahab and Joshaphat. Oh, by the way, we'll just go ahead and, and spoil this. How do they seal that alliance between them? Mm. Has, has marriage to a wicked woman gone well for Ahab? Well, Ahab's daughter is just like her mother, and now she's married to a king in Judah. You can kind of see where this is going, can't you? Yeah, it's going to have uh, reaching effects in both kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So you have this alliance between Ahab and Jehoshaphat. And uh, it's not just an alliance of, hey, we'll be nice to each other. Uh, they go to war with each other against Syria. So in this battle, they obviously want to figure out what's going to, what's going to happen. They have some prophets telling them that things are going to go really well. These are Ahab's prophets. Josh Bat's not convinced by that, so he asked for a prophet of the Lord. They get one, and what are they told? Yeah, who's it particularly not going to go well for? Ahab. Yeah, it's not going to go well for Ahab. Ahab, Josh Bat, I guess kind of ignore this. Uh, Ahab does try to take some precautions, it seems. Does it work? No, does not work. He's still killed in the battle because... Whatever God promises is going to happen. That's one thing we see th throughout all of this, right? Your line's going to end. It's going to end. If you're going to die, you're going to die. If God promises it, it's going to happen. So Jehoshaphat's also rebuked during this time for his alliance that they have. Uh, unfortunately, it does not seem like that's going to be something that uh, he's going to learn to apply to other relationships. But he's rebuked about his relationship with the evil king. Um, but sticking on Jehoshaphat for just a second to kind of wrap up what his reign was like as a whole. Again, it was a good reign. So this is even said after the, the stuff with Ahab here. He has a good reign. Um, he is uh, trying to bring the people to the Lord. Um, but we see that he ends up allying himself with Ahab's son. And so we have Ahaziah next. Ahaziah reigns for two years. He's evil. He serves Baal. Um, and like I said, he had an alliance with Jehoshaphat. But he did not seek the Lord. And so he was sentenced to death. And what's interesting is that he, he seems to try to, I don't know if the right words appeal, but he tries to send for Elijah uh, to maybe ask about this situation. He does not respect Elijah. And that does not go well for a few of his servants. But eventually Elijah does come and tells him, no. You're, you're going to die. And he does. So this is a confusing time right now because, so you've got this marriage between Ahab's daughter and Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram, and then they start naming their children after their their you know their uncles and cousins, and so you're going to have a, you're going to have a Jehoram up at the north, you're going to have a Jehoram in the south, you're going to have an Ahaziah in the south, you're going to have an Ahaziah in the north, and some of them are reigning almost at the same time, and and so it's a little confusing to go through this, but we'll we'll cover kind of the details of the flow of what's happening. Yeah. It's going to be great. <laughs> All right. So let's take a break from that for a second. We're going to talk about Elijah and Elisha for just a minute. So Elijah's already called Elisha. We're actually toward the end of their time together. And they know this. Um, what, what happens? I, I don't know how much to say to this. What happens <clears throat> as far as Elijah's departure? Good. That's pretty significant, right? That's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, we also have that um, 
Elijah, well, I guess Elijah asked Elisha if he has any requests. And you remember what he asked for? What Elisha asked for? So I think a double portion of his spirit, and he does get his cloak. So when Elijah's taken up, his cloak is left, and Elisha picks it up. Hopefully I got the name right all the way through that. I'm not sure. Either way, so he takes up the cloak, and he's also taking up the mantle. Um, we see pretty early on his authority and power displayed, uh, showing that he is the next, uh, the next prophet that God is going to be speaking through, you know, Maybe maybe the major one speaking to kings and that kind of thing. Uh, you have anything you want to say through that section? Okay. That's true. Yes. Thank you. So some of the prophecies, so like Haziel, that's great. Uh, anointing Haziel, that's going to happen through Elisha. That's good. Thank you for mentioning that. All right. So then we go back to Israel. So Israel, uh, we said Ahaziah died. Ahab's Another one of Ahab's son, Jehoram, he's going to reign. He reigns for 12 years. He's evil. He actually does not practice bell worship. He's going to practice uh, what Jeroboam did. So I guess he's slightly better, but still not good, right? Um, then we go back to Judah. You'll love this. And in Judah, we have the son of Jehoshaphat, who's Jehoram. And he's going to start reigning. So we have a Jehoram and a Jehoram reigning. He reigns for eight years. He was evil. Uh, and you mentioned earlier what who might have been an influence on him to be evil. His wife, Athaliah, who was Jezebel's daughter. That's right. So he worships the Baals. So this is the first time we have Baal worship in Judah. Yes. Um, which is, again, you're talking about going from Jehoshaphat to this. Big departure. Big departure here. Yeah. It, something else about him. So kind of we're talking about, you know, him, the wickedness ramping up in Judah now, he does something that no other king in Judah has ever done before. Besides that, what else does he do? Do you remember, anybody remember? He kills all of his brothers. Now, I want you to think about this from the big picture standpoint. Who's the Messiah coming through? David's lineage. Do you realize now it's hanging by a thread? Jehoram is the only one that's the rightful heir. One person is alive. What happens to him? If something happens to him, God's plan falls apart. This is one generation where this happens. Watch, it will happen again. So we've, we've got, we've got the, the messianic promise hanging by a thread here with all of his brothers wiped out. It's possible he may have had sons at this point already. Yeah, maybe. But, yeah, you're right. But either way, like you said, it, something like this will happen again. Um, we also see that God only spares him because of his promise to David, even through all of his wickedness. He also seemed to not be a very respected king. So not, the, not a whole lot went right in his rule. Uh, we had people oppressing them. We had people plundering uh, the king's house. And uh, he dies because of a disease of, of the bowels. And when he, when he dies, no one honors him in his death. And uh, he wasn't buried with the kings. And so things just did not go well for him spiritually or physically or anything. It was just not good for him at all. Anything to say about that before we jump back to Elisha? Okay. All right. So we go back to Elisha, and I think I'm going to have to move a little bit more quickly through this part. Basically, what we have is we have several uh, accounts of miracles talked about here. And there, there are some smaller ones I'm probably not going to mention. I say smaller just in the perspective of not a lot said about them. But we have the incident with the Shunammite woman about how she's able to give birth because of the kindness she and her husband showed. To Elisha, son dies, he's able to bring the son back. We also have the miracle with Naaman, so Naaman's leprosy. And uh, we have Elisha telling him to dip in the Jordan seven times. He does, and he's cleansed. Uh, then we have later on, the Israelites are at war with the Syrians. And the Syrians are plotting surprise attacks. Uh, Elisha knows about this because God has told him. He tells the king of Israel and that thwarts several of those. And so, uh, and you also see maybe some, some ways of counterattacks there. And this is the, the, the time where God strikes all the Syrians with blindness and they lead them into Samaria. And they're like, should we kill them? And then the answer is no, feed them and then send them back. And so they do. But it does seem like 
almost in response to this, to all of that's happening, the king of Syria is like, all right, well, we're just going to ramp this up even further and try to attack even harder. And they do. And they besiege Samaria. And this is a really bad time because, uh, well, there's, there's no food. And you have people, you have women eating their children. You have them uh, doing all kinds of horrible things to try to survive. Um, the way that ends up is, again, with God taking care of his people. And basically what he does is he drives the Syrians out without the Israelites ever knowing. Uh, four lepers are the ones that discover this, uh, discover the, the spoil that's left over, and then they uh, go back and tell the Israelites. But God is, again, wicked people, the Israelites, God's still taking care of them. Uh, now, they have to go through hard times because I think he's trying to teach them lessons but he's still not destroying them utterly. So all of these miracles with Eli Elisha, particularly the ones where the most powerful enemy in their region, the Syrians, God is able to strike them with blindness, capture them without an Israelite being lost, feed them when they are in uh, besiegement and starvation with, as, as one man said, well, if windows in heaven were opened and food were dumped out, I don't see how God could do that. And, uh, and Elisha said, well, you'll see it. <laughs> you'll see it. And, and, and God's able to do that. The whole point is they don't need the Baals. God can provide for them. They don't need Baal worship. That seems to be their struggle. Well, should we worship the Baals or should we worship God? You don't need Baal. God can take care of you. And God's demonstrating that through the miracles of Elisha. Yes, sir. In a sense, you mentioned how chaotic all of this was. In, in a sense, he's teaching them, trying to teach them the same lesson that this really all started with years ago when they had a king. They had God as their king. Yes. But that wasn't good enough for them. That's right. And now they're paying the price, or they may not be, but their descendants are, and those same lessons are still trying to be taught. I love what you're saying. They said, we want a king like the nations around us. That's exactly what they have right now. Our kings like the nations around them. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a disaster. So uh, to wrap up the section about Elisha, uh, what we have is we have the fulfillment of the prophecy uh, that Elijah would anoint Hazael, king of Syria. Uh, and just as a reminder, this is where the king of Syria is sick, sends Hazael to find out if he's going to be made well or not. Hazael's told he's going to be the next king and that he's actually going to do horrible damage to the Israelites. Uh, Hazael goes back. King says, am I going to get better? Oh, yeah, you'll be fine. Kills him that night and becomes king. So, And then he ends up being a constant enemy to the Israelites. So that is something worth noting just because that was a prophecy. All right, now we're going to go back to Judah. So with Judah, we have Ahaziah. Ahaziah is the son of Jehoram. He reigns for one year. He was evil. He continued in bell worship. And he allied himself with Jehoram. And he actually goes to visit Jehoram uh, um, whenever Jehoram was sick. And then the story shifts to a man named Jehu. So Elisha sends a messenger to Jehu. And what is Jehu told? You're going to be the next king. You're going to be the next king. Does Jehu wait very long to make good on that promise? No. He starts cleaning house immediately. So he goes and takes care of Jehoram. And I guess as a bonus, he takes care of Ahaziah while he's there. Yeah. So takes care of them both at the same time, gets them both killed. Then he goes and kills Jezebel. Or I guess he doesn't kill her, but he has her killed, thrown out of the window. And then he kills all of Ahab's sons, all his relatives, his friends, and the priest of Baal. I mean, he really cleans house. He gets rid of everything that he can. And he becomes king, and he does not engage in bell worship. So he's the first Israelite king in a while that doesn't engage in bell worship. Well, I guess we had, uh, well, it doesn't matter. What well, rinky moving. All right. Either way, but he still does not serve God correctly because he falls back to the practices of Jeroboam. This is so sad because with, with Jehu, you have a clean start. I mean, Baal worship has been wiped out like it never has been since it was introduced. This is an opportunity for a clean start. But like you said, he goes right back and starts the practices of Jeroboam again. So he's promised that his lineage is going to end. 
But because he filled, fulfilled God's promises about cleaning out Ahab's house, he's going to have four generations. He reigns 28 years. Going back to Judah, we have Ahaziah's death, right? He got knocked out with Jehoram from Israel. Last slide. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. So, Athaliah, his mother, wants to become queen, and she tries to kill everybody who could oppose her. She's not entirely successful. Not, not those people who would oppose her. She just wants to make sure nobody could even succeed her in any way. Who does she wipe out? Her own grandchildren. It, you said not completely successful. One survives. Yeah. So Joash is uh, saved, and he's raised by Jehoiada. How many descendants do we have of the Messianic line now? One. Second generation where we're down to one. Yes. And he is, he's a baby. So she gets to reign. I say, get, I guess she gets to reign for seven years. She's evil, obviously. Um, when Joash reaches seven years old, Jehoiada helps him become king. They kill Athaliah, help him become king. He reigns for 40 years. His reign at first, very, very good. Until Jehoiada dies. So things go great until Jehoiada dies. Jehoiada dies. He starts listening to the princes. And then they abandon the Lord. They undo a lot of the good that had been done. And then basically what we see is we see him injured by the series. So things are going downhill, not just spiritually, but again, physically. Those things are often intertwined. Um, the Syrians are able to injure him in battle, but they're not the ones that finish him off. It's his own servants that finish him off. And so they kill Joash. And particularly it mentions they kill Joash because Jehoiada, who was the one who raised him, his son, Zechariah, came to bring him back to the Lord, and he killed off Jehoiada's son. And so his servants did obviously did not appreciate that, and they killed Joash. My, yeah, we had an opportunity here for a great restart in, uh, in, in Judah as well, but again, there wasn't the commitment there with Joash, and so it reverts back to the same practices. All right. So we're going to, we're going to move fast now. All right. All right. So... Be quiet is what you're saying. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> All right. So in Israel, we have the son of Jehu, who's Jehoahaz. He reigns for 17 years. He's evil. He's also practicing the sins of Jeroboam. Uh, we see that he does seek God at one point, and God does listen to him, but he's still evil. He dies. Jehoash, his son, Jehoahaz's son, reigns for 16 years. He's evil. He practices Jeho uh, Jeroboam's worship. He fought with Amaziah. And he's also the one that whenever Elisha was dying, went to see Elisha. Elisha told him to hit the ground with the arrow. He did it three times. That's as many victories as he's going to have against the Syrians. So that does come to pass. And then we'll move on for him in a second. Going back to Judah, we have Amaziah, who's the son of Joash. He reigns 29 years. He is righteous, but he does not take down the high places. So it specifically mentions that. He's righteous, but doesn't take down the high places. We see he has a respect for the law. Uh, but then, you remember I told you earlier we're going to have a theme? So he does really well. But then he starts worshiping idols, and he's condemned for that. And his servants kill him as well. So just like Joash's father, he's killed by his servants. All right. Going back to Israel real quick. We have Jeroboam II, who's the son of Joash. He reigns for 41 years. He was evil. Uh, it says that he does a lot of physical good for the kingdom, but not spiritually. Got to make a comment here. Go ahead. All right. During Jeroboam's time is probably the most prosperous time for Israel in their whole, their whole time as a nation. And you wonder, well, why? Because they've had nothing but wicked kings. I think that God is using a different tactic. In other words, what God did is he chastened them. Did, how did they respond to God's chastening? They didn't respond. So he says, okay, well, let me show you how I can bless you. And so he blesses them. How do they respond to that? And so it's like, what works? You know, he, God's reaching out in every way that He can, and they're, they're not responding. So the last one we're going to really get to spend much time on is going to be Uzziah, so also known as Azariah, who's the son of Amaziah. He ran for 52 years. Again, he was righteous. He sought the Lord. He had a lot of good things happen because the Lord blessed him. But then he grew proud, and he was unfaithful, and the Lord struck him with leprosy. Uh, until and he had it until he died. So I mentioned that it was a good time for, for Judah. It was also a good time for Israel. 
In Judah, they made no response to the Lord. What did it do for Israel, at least with Isaiah? Made him proud. And so... Then in Israel, we go through several kings in a row. So we have the son of Jeroboam, Zechariah. He reigns for six months, and then he's killed, which that fulfills the prophecy. Uh, pro promise. Prophecy. <laughs> prophecy should be a word. All right. And then you have uh, Shalem, who comes after him. He reigns for one month, and he's killed by Menahem. Menahem. And then he reigns for 10 years. He was very evil. Uh, and then he dies. And you have Pekahiah, who is his son, reigns for two years. He's killed by Pekah. And then you have Pekah reigning for 20 years. And then the last one we talked about was Jotham, the son of Uzziah in Judah. And he ran for 16 years, and he was righteous, even though the high places were still not taken. All right, so what you see right here on this chart is just the death spiral of, of Israel. They're just, God, God has exhausted all of his means of trying to reach them. Nothing has changed, and then you just see them imploding. And destroying, and that's going to be the end. Seven twenty-two, Israel falls. God says, "Okay," and allows the Syrians to carry them away captive, which is where we will pick up in the next quarter. Thank y'all for being willing to drink out of a fire hydrant as we try to cover three months worth of material in forty minutes. Uh, appreciate that. Hopefully, it was a helpful review, and will bring us up to speed as we get into the new material. Uh, curriculums are in the back on the table. And so if you've not picked one up, please pick one up. I would ask you, please read the material beforehand so that we can discuss it in class. You'll be familiar with it, and then we can try to bring points from it in the discussion that we have in class. Thank you for your good attention tonight. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.